How do you identify? Uh oh. Where is this going, right? Uh, that's a loaded question today, right? But, um, but today's use of that term, of that terminology, that's not our topic for tonight. Uh, so, so what am I talking about when I ask that question? I'm talking about how do, how do you identify before God? AKA what theologians call, and here's the, the kind of the million dollar word, right? What theologians call positional truth. Positional truth. Now half of you probably immediately fell asleep at that term, but, uh, but hang with me. Hang with me. Positional truth can be a powerful thing for us. It's, it's one of my favorite things to kind of mentally, spiritually chew on. But, uh, but what is it, right? What is, what is positional truth? When the Bible says you know, we as Christians are, um, are, are justified, right, or redeemed, or adopted, or set apart, we're forgiven, we're blameless, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, we're given, we, we're heirs to an inheritance. These aren't just different ways to say the same thing, right? The, God, the, the Bible writers weren't like, or the apostles weren't like, just looking, up the, looking at the thesaurus saying like, you know, what's another way to say this? Uh, all these different terms that they throw at us. But these are different, real aspects, uh, different nuances about salvation, about our standing before God, and ha about how we can relate to him because of what Jesus did in the gospel. So when we talk about uh, positional truth, when we're, when, we're, when we're saying these terms, right, these justified, redeemed, things like that, when we're talking about positional truth, it sounds a lot just like, oh, we're just being given the gospel. I'm just hearing the gospel again uh, for the, like, like it's the first time. But I think we miss out on, on great riches when we look at, you know, these glorious passages that talk about our positional truth uh, merely as, you know, the gospel ABCs, right? That, or, or this is just that, these are just synonyms for, um, I'm going to heaven when I die. Uh, I think we miss out on the great riches of, of what the gospel, of what the Bible writers want us to know. All of us start with the gospel, right? All of us start our Christian life with the gospel. Amen? Amen, right? In Colossians 2.6, Paul says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So this is what I mean when I say it's powerful. Uh, this is the, the, the deeper we go with it, right? The deeper we're rooted into it, the, the deeper we sink our roots into positional truth, the more we're able to recognize and recite its beauties to our hearts, the more it transforms us into his image. Understanding positional truth changes your identity. This is what the Holy Spirit says about me, right? So this is my identity. And of course, when your identity changes, so too will your walk with God. In other words, the more you appreciate the gospel of Jesus Christ, right, uh, and the position that it gives you, the more it will affect real change in you, changing the way we think, the way we feel, the way we act, and the way we react. Uh, maybe positional truth. Uh, maybe it fails to impact us because, you know, when we think of it, we think of it as just kind of like purely theoretical, right? Um, like it's just kind of this thing that I know that the Bible says it's true. It was, hey, it's a cool word, uh, whatever, whatever word it's saying. Um, you know, I, I've read this before, but it's not really a game changer. Like, you know, like, yeah, I know black holes are out there, but, you know, I'm never going to see one. It's not going to really, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, maybe, for many of us, the, uh, it's just not being given this position, this exalted position, it's just not a paradigm that we're used to, right? We, we've always had to perform uh, well to gain favor with our parents or with our teachers or with our coaches, uh, with our friends. You know, we have human relationships that, that make us insecure, make us feel inadequate. You know, what if we fail to please them? And then that translates into us even as, Christians, try, even as Christians trying to keep God well pleased by our, by our strict law keeping. So tonight, 
uh, we're going to spend the next few moments contemplating this idea of positional truth as it is communicated to us by the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 5. Notice uh, our text begins with the word, therefore. I don't have the stylus here. I'm going to use my finger. Okay. Notice our text begins with the word, therefore. Well, stop right there, right? Um, We need to know what was going on at the end of Romans 4 if we want to have any context for, for this therefore here. So let's just hop back a verse to verse 25 of Romans, uh, Romans, verse 25 of Romans 4. Um, at the end of Romans 4, Paul is, is, is explaining the idea of justification by faith, right? Uh, review time. What does it mean to be justified in the Bible sense? We have anybody that was back there? What was, what was that study when, when we were going through that and Steve was going through all those, all those different words? We, we had the per- definition for propitiation. We had the definition for justified. Forget the other ones. I know we had redeemed, but he had all these definitions. And he drilled us. So if you were here then, you have no excuse. <laughs> to be justified in the Bible sense means to be what? Declared righteous. Declared righteous. Yes. That was, that was the textbook definition. That was the one we used. And that's what it means, right? To be declared righteous. The person isn't righteous, but in a legal sense, as far as their guilt goes, they are innocent, right? In a courtroom sense, it's as if they did it right. They're declared righteous. If positional truth were a temple, justification would surely be one of the pillars. My position before God is as if I were one who did it right declared righteous. Did I actually do it right? No. No. But Jesus changes everything. And in Romans 4, Paul's making the point that justification, the only way we can be justified is by faith, right? It's the only way it can be attained. He talks about Abraham. I'm going to use that tip you gave me before. There we go. He talks about how uh, Abraham, how even for Abraham, right? Pre-Messiah, pre-Jesus, pre-cross, Righteousness was credited to Abraham because of his faith. And Paul's like, just like Abraham was justified by faith, so too are we. It doesn't change. It's still true. All we or anyone ever needed to do to obtain righteousness, the only thing we needed to bring to that exchange was faith. And on this side of the cross, we're talking about faith in Jesus Christ, right? And so Jesus Christ, and then Romans 4, 25 Jesus Christ, who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. And then Paul then proceeds to kind of gush about the position we now have because we have been justified, right? Raised, for our justific- raised because of our justification. He gives three blessings, right? Three realities of justification that are ours to enjoy because Jesus Christ brings us personally into the welcome of the Father. Jesus Christ brings us personally into the welcome of the Father. And so we have peace with God. Let's look at Romans 5, chapter 1. Therefore, Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Since we have justification, right, which only comes by faith, right, only, beco- only comes by faith, now we have peace with God. Peace wouldn't be possible if we still stood in our guilt, not declared righteous, unjustified. God would still be our enemy. Not that he's the one that's looking to like pick a fight. We're the ones who, who uh, uh, that's on us, right? We're, all we like sheep have gone astray. We're the ones who went astray. But since we've been declared righteous, peace is not only possible, it's actual. This is what Paul is saying. This isn't just, hey, you can have, this is, uh, this, is, this is the actual state of things. This is the reality of the situation. And the word peace here, the word peace that we're talking about here, this, um, this is beyond just 
no hostilities, right? When there's peace between warring countries, we say, oh, there's peace now, they're not fighting. This, is, this goes beyond that. This is kind of like the, uh, this is a more positive nuance. This is like the shalom kind of peace, right? Peace like well-being. There's prosperity, there's harmony. We're just good with God now. Notice, too, that this peace comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is how peace is possible. Jesus is how peace is possible. So how does that work, right? Well, what's the last thing Paul said about Christ? Right? Well, for that, that's what we looked at a second ago. That's what we looked at a second ago in chapter 4. He was delivered over because of our transgressions and raised because of justification. Right? This is the last thing we heard about him. So we have a connection here. There's a connection between Delivered over, this is like his death on the cross, right? We have a connection between death and transgressions, resurrection and justification, right? You can see this, parallel, this, this kind of parallel structure we've got here. The death was payment for sin, right? That makes sense. He was delivered over because of transgressions. They needed to be paid for. But look at this, the next connection he was raised because of our justification. That's an interesting pairing, right? These are not usually two uh, Bible words or theology words that team up, but here we have raised because of our justification. Resurrection and justification. And without overemphasizing, I don't want to overemphasize these connections here. You know, what do the, for, what do the fours mean? You know, what do the because ofs mean? Because of here, is it the same because of in the one phrase and the same because of in the other phrase? Uh, you know, is it for the sake of here, uh, but because of here? Uh, but it could just be saying, you know, the death and the resurrection, they are basic truths to salvation. It could just be saying that, but we can at least acknowledge, I still think we need to acknowledge that this is very deliberate by Paul. Delivered for transgressions, raised for justification, right? So what does the resurrection have to do with justification? And why does it matter? And how does that carry over into my peace with God that we saw in, in, in chapter 5? Um, the best way to understand this, right, is that the resurrection secures our justification, right? It guarantees our justification, right? Think about it. What happened in the resurrection, what happened in the resurrection? Jesus was raised from the dead, right? Jesus has new life. He lives, right? He lives, and he's ascended, and he's at the right hand of the Father. And that means he's there. He's there. And his being there makes it possible for us to be, to be declared righteous, right, before the Father, right? Do you see how these concepts are sequential in Paul's mind? He says, he says Jesus is raised in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 25, securing our justification, and now we have peace with God, right? These are sequential in Paul's mind. So through Jesus Christ, right, through Jesus Christ means he's there making, he's there making the peace, making the peace. Think about it like this. Imagine, now kids, you're going to have to do a little make-believe here, um, even the grown-ups, because I just said imagine, but... Uh, Imagine you've got a son, right? A little boy, right? A little guy, let's call him, let's, we'll name him Bobby, right? He's a little rascal. Um, he's, uh, but he's, he's a cute little guy, and, uh, and you love him, right? You love him, you love him. He's your son, of course. And one day, you're at home, and this other kid, about your son's age, he knocks on your door after school, and uh, he's, he's, you come to the door, and, and you don't know this kid, right? It's just, he's a total stranger, and you think maybe he's selling, like, Boy Scout stuff or, or baskets of popcorn or chocolate. You know, what does this kid want, right? And he says, hey, my name's Johnny. I'm friends with Bobby. And Bobby was, uh, Bobby was telling me how when he comes home from school, you know, you make him a pizza. Uh, you know, he gets in his comfy clothes. He plays some video games, watches his favorite cartoons, and... I want you to do that for me. Uh, I want you to, you know, he told me to tell you that you should do that for me. And, uh, you know, I know, he has also, I know he has a birthday coming up. And uh, so if you could get out maybe some of his presents, and if they're still wrapped, that's fine. Maybe I could unwrap a couple of them and uh, maybe take one or two of them home with me. And so that's what I'm here to do, right? So let's go ahead. 
let's, uh, let's get that pizza in the oven, you know, give me, get me, point me in the direction of those comfy clothes, uh, tell me where those video, uh, the video games and the presents are, and you know, let's get this thing going. How would you respond? You'd be like, get out of here, kid. You know, you got some guts, buddy. I'll give you that, but, uh, you know, I don't know you. Get lost. But now, imagine the same kid, the same scenario, but Bobby's there, standing at the door with you, and Bobby says, hey, Dad, hey, Mom, this is my friend Johnny. Can we have a pizza? Of course you can have a pizza. You know, why don't you guys go play some video games? You know, hey, you just had that birthday. You know, why don't you guys break out some of those presents, go play with them? You know, all the blessings that my son gets, all the blessings that accrue to him for being my son now are being given to this other kid who a moment ago was a stranger, but, but now these things are being given to Johnny through Bobby, my son. Right? You see this? It would, be like if we, and it would be like if we came to God separate from Jesus Christ, right? And we're like, hey, you know how you love Jesus? Uh, you know, all of that I want, right? All the favor he gets, that all the favor you give to him, all the blessings that come to him for, for all that he's done right, I would like to have those. Uh, I want you to hear me every time I talk to you. I want you to hear me and I want you to answer me. All of your favor, all of your grace, I want it. And the father's like, who are you? You've got some guts, you know, yeah, I see you, buddy. But it's not even that we're some stranger, right? The father, that the father doesn't know. The father, he knows us, and, and he knows what we've been up to, and he's like, you know, you're the kid that's been throwing mud at my garage, and, and, and you're riding your bike through my garden, and throwing toilet paper in my trees. You know, get out of here before I call the police. You don't deserve any of that stuff. But having been justified, attached to Jesus, by faith and repentance, Jesus brings peace, that shalom, that well-being with the Father. Jesus brings us personally into the welcome of the Father, so we have peace. That's why when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name, right? I'm here before you, God. Look at me as being identified with in connection to your Son. My identification is in Jesus. I am in him. Look at me as being in him. Jesus is righteous, right? He is. He is. God says, this is my beloved son, and I am really, really happy with him. He does all the Father's will perfectly and completely. He came to fulfill the law, and at the cross he said, it is finished, right? I did it all. I did it all right. I did it all perfectly. Jesus, therefore, he's the one who deserves all those blessings, right? He deserves all the promises God made. He deserves those things. They belong to him, and he's the only one to whom they belong. We are not righteous, right? We are not, uh, we don't deserve anything. I mean, technically, we do deserve something, but it's not good. Um, but again, and again, staying in context here, but we're going to hop back to Romans 4.24, We don't deserve anything, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him. It will be credited. It will be counted to us. Right? What did we do? We just believed in him. By faith, Jesus brings us into a relationship with the Father in such a way that Jesus' success is counted to us. His righteousness, his intimate relationship with God the Father, is counted to us simply because we trust the righteous one. So now, as we stand before the Father, connected to his Son, the affection he has for Jesus, for Jesus Christ, his Son, that spills over onto us. Right? And we get the benefits that Jesus alone deserves. Jesus brings us personally into the welcome of the Father. And the next reality of, of, of justification that comes in verse 2. Right? So therefore, having been justified by faith, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained introduction by faith into this grace. And we'll just stop. In, into this grace in which we stand. 
The next reality of justification, access into grace. Right? Through, uh, the, notice verse 2 starts, through whom, through him. There's that phrase again, right? Interesting. Through him, we have obtained access, or in this, uh, here in this translation, introduction by faith, or introduction. And nor- normally we would expect access, right? The idea of access, the idea of introduction, we would expect that to be something like access to like, kind of like how we heard this morning, right? Access to God, access to, you know, he hears my prayers when I pray to him. I can go to him whenever I want. But in this, in this verse, we have access, we have, we are introduced into what? Into this grace in which we stand. All that we have comes by grace, right? Paul has already said in, in, in chapter 3, verse 34, we are justified by grace as a gift, right? The promise of God rests on grace, chapter 4, verse 16. We're talking about this new realm in which we find ourselves uh, showered with grace, right? The full blessings of salvation constantly available, not as, as a result of law, but by grace. In other words, Jesus himself doesn't just introduce us to the Father's hospitality, right? But we have regular access to it. Uh, we have, just, just like he does, right? We go back to Johnny. Um, and you observe his relationship with your son, right? And you see that, that Johnny trusts your son, Bobby. He recognizes all of the admirable traits that you see in your son. All the things that you love about your son, you see that Johnny appreciates those things. He recognizes the value that you see. You see that there is a genuine friendship, a genuine relationship there. How are you going to treat that kid? You're going to treat him like family, right? You're you're a good friend of my son. You're, You're a good friend of my son's. You're a good friend of mine, right? Our house is open to you anytime, anytime. We're going to go out for ice cream. Hey, why don't you invite Johnny? You know, we're going, to go to, we're going to go to Six Flags. We're going to go to the beach. You know, see if Johnny wants to go. Hey, you guys, you know, you guys want some hot dogs? You want to go on some rides? Whatever. You're going to pour out your blessings on that kid through his relationship with your son. In the same way, the father pours out his blessing to those who trust his son. To those who understand who Jesus is and what Jesus did like the Father understands who Jesus is and what Jesus has actually done. When you and I put our faith in Christ, we're saying, I understand who Jesus is, right? I understand a little bit about what he did for me. I understand a little bit about what all this means. So when the Father sees that we appreciate Jesus the way he appreciates Jesus, the Father is well pleased. The Father is well pleased with us by faith. And so we have all the gospel benefits, right? We're not just where we are in Jesus' name. We have all that we have in Jesus' name. Uh, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. There's that phrase again, right? Every, he has blessed us the God, God has blessed us with what? He has blessed us with what? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. How or through whom? In Christ, right? Father saying, mi casa es su casa, right? Come on in. You're in Christ. Get on in here. Across the page in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes, and he's, it's something very similar, right? God raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places, there's that phrase again, in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace. Remember, we, we, have, we have been introduced into this grace in which we stand. The surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Where are we? We are in the place Jesus deserves to be. What do we have? All the riches of grace. All the riches of grace. The riches that Jesus deserves, we don't deserve them, but we have them in Christ. So what does that mean? Okay? What does that mean? It means when the Father, see, well, you know, when the father sees you, 
What does he see? When you think about what does the Father see when he looks at me? What's he see? What's your identity before him? What's the lie we always fall for? Oh, he sees my sin and my shame. He sees my filth and my folly. Oh, he's holding these things against me. He's withholding blessing from me. No. Brothers and sisters, here's what this truth means. It means when the Father sees you, Christian, genuine Christian, you who have trusted in Christ, right? Genuinely repented of your sin and don't use grace as a license to serve yourself. When the Father sees you, he sees you in relation to his Son, Jesus Christ. To be in Christ, to be justified through Christ, to be in the grace in which you stand, it doesn't just mean you're a saved soul. It means you have been brought into the welcome of the Father. Safe and secure, right? This isn't some back alley deal here. This is legitimate. Which brings us to the last reality of, of justification. Uh, and that is that we have, you know, Jesus has brought us, brings us personally into the welcome of the Father. And so we have reassuring hope. And that comes at the end of verse 2 here. We have reassuring hope. Again, back in verse 2, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, right? This access to this grace in which we stand. And we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Uh, this word exult, right, can be translated, uh, your translation might say, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, right? Uh, it can also be translated boast. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. In other words, we can say that one of the best things going on about me is my future, is my hope, is my hope. And what's the object of that hope? Again, we hope the hope of the glory of God. What do we know about the glory of God in the book of Romans? Right? We know that it's something that we fall short of. Chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned, finish it, and fall short of the glory of God, right? That is that, it's that God-likeness that is lost, that is missed because of sin. We've missed the mark. But now, having been justified through Jesus, him alongside us, where once we fell short, we now have confidence that God-likeness, the glory of God, will be restored to us on the last day. We exult, we rejoice, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Philippians 1.6 Philippians 1.6 For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of, Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus. He will perfect it. He will finish it. He will complete it. The reassuring hope, uh, uh, it, it assures us of a, of a complete salvation. That's what we're talking about here. This is the God-likeness that is, that is restored to us. It is a complete and total and full salvation, and he will complete it. And how many, you know, how many times this week did you stumble, right? Put your foot in your mouth. Uh, go through the day, the whole day, not even acknowledging God. You know, regurgitate old habits, act a fool. How many times did you do that this week? And, but while we go, grow frustrated with uh, you know, our present failures to, to, to be all that God would want us to be, we now look forward, we exult in the hope of the glory of God. We, we, we look forward to that struggle being over. Having been justified, Jesus will bring us all the way, a complete salvation. And this hope also, we're also talking about this hope. Let's look in verse 3. What else is this reassuring hope? do for us. It also assures us in suffering. Verse 3, and not only this, right, not only do we exult in the hope of the glory of God, but we also exult in our tribulations, in our sufferings. None of us are exempt from suffering, right? We're all going to face the, the regular sufferings, uh, loss, hardship, 
failure, heartbreak, persecution, aging, illness. We're all going to get the usual sufferings, and some of us are going to get a handful of unusual ones. We won't be able to unpack um, all of the phrase by phrase here in verses 3 and 4 in this, in this section here, but, but we, we need to ask, we're talking about justification. Does justification, does my position of being declared righteous, does it matter when I'm suffering? According to Paul, the answer is yes. How? We rejoice, back in verse 3, we rejoice knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, or sufferings bring about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. One of the great lies we all fall for is that suffering, tribulations, are the opposite of shining. Right? That if we're suffering, we are somehow prevented from being vessels of God's glory. Right? But he, you know, here, did you notice, did you notice that this, the text says, it doesn't say we rejoice or we exult despite our sufferings. It doesn't say we rejoice amidst our sufferings. It says we exult in our sufferings, in our tribulations. The suffering, the tribulation, Paul says, that's the occasion for our joy because it builds my faith. Ask any marathon runner, right? Any, any, um, ask Matt, you're a marathon runner, right? Ask any, any bodybuilder, uh, you know, the pain that they go through when they're, when they're training helps them withstand more pain, helps them to go harder than last time, shave off one more second, get in one more rep, right? And as their tolerance builds, as their tolerance builds, they've been tested. They learn to persevere, right, with confidence, knowing that tribulation, that these sufferings, that this pain brings about perseverance, perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And, we're not, and when this talks about proven character here, right, right we're not talking about, oh, these are the good qualities, these are the qualities that make you like an excellent job candidate. You know, when you go to apply for a job, you know, you, you show up on time, you're responsible, you're well-mannered. I'm not talking about that kind of character. We're talking about a person who, in darkest sufferings, in the meanest injustices, can face them because he knows something, right? This has been tested in him. He knows something. He doesn't know why he's going through the suffering, but he knows that all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. He knows there is a good, a better good beyond the suffering. We pray a lot of times for God to work in us, right? Uh, we pray for him to shine bright through us, right? We pray for more wisdom, more light, more comfort, more understanding. And I think a lot of times we just kind of hope he like, zaps us with some God rays and then, you know, we've got it. Great. Thanks for, thanks, for, uh, thanks for granting that wish. But it's in suffering where we find those things. It's in suffering where we get what it is that we're asking for. Because when we're suffering, we're at our most raw and our most real. And when we suffer, we contemplate, sometimes wrestle with truths about God. Things that the Bible is saying that are, are true about God and our character is tested. Am I going to believe this thing or not? But those truths become sweeter because we find that we really need them. And we know without those truths, without knowing that we are in the welcome of the Father, we really are alone. Right? We really are in darkness. But like Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen, ves in earthen vessels. Some say, translations say, in jars of clay, right? And what do you know about jars of clay? They're not great jars. They're not great jars, right? In other words, we're carrying this amazing, glorious thing 
in very unglorious vessels, you know, vessels that are subject to much wear and tear, right? Much suffering. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. And later down in verse 16, Therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. In other words, character produces hope, right? Our sufferings increase the certainty of our hope because we know something. We know we are in the welcome of the Father who works all things together for good. Lastly, and quickly, back in the text here, the reassuring hope, uh, it, it assures us that of a complete salvation, it assures us in times of suffering, and it assures us that we are loved. It assures us that we are loved. Back in the text, verse 5, Actually, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll start in verse 3 and then get down into verse 5. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. Verse 5, and hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The hope that we have, the hope that builds in us because of justification, even on this side of suffering, it will not disappoint. It is not insufficient because it's based on God's love, right? Because the love of God has been poured out. And the love of God, which in three verses, Paul is going to tell us a little bit about the love of God. In three verses, God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Thus the extent of God's love. But that love has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. The reassuring hope we get is that God loves us. Right? It is based on God's love. Paul tells us it was so clearly demonstrated on the cross. He who spared not, he who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he freely not give us all things? God abundantly assures us of his love, right? The love of God has been poured out. It's not just like, yeah, he loves you. He gives you his love. It's been a poured out within our hearts. Um, and it's the Holy Spirit, right? It's the Holy Spirit who resides in every believer who comes alongside you and says, take a look around, right? Take a look around at your position. Take a look. You are loved, and you are a part of this family. To someone like Johnny, this is music to his ears, right? Sometimes he acts out, he acts out in school, doesn't have a great home life. He has an abusive father. He struggles. He feels lost, inadequate, full of anxiety, to someone like Bobby, this reassuring hope that assures him of God's love, right? That, 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 assures, him of, uh, that assures him of love. It is music to his ears, right? So when Johnny gets to hang out with Bobby, enjoying all the family blessings, you know, he's not rabble-rousing. He is loving life. This is who I'm meant to be. This is is how it's meant to be, and this is how I want it to be always. Positional truth. We are declared righteous, and therefore we are attached to Jesus Christ in the Father's eyes at an identity level. Who are you to God? Just like, just like this is Johnny, Bobby's friend. I am I am Joseph in Christ, right? I am, I am Joseph justified by Jesus Christ. It is an identity level change. 
One last text we'll look at. Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. So what do we do with our identity, right? What do we do with this position that we have in Jesus' name? Colossians 3, in, in the name of the Lord Jesus, what do we do? Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Live your life, right? Whatever you do in word or deed, live your life with the Father the way Jesus lived. Live to hallow his name, right? To set it apart as special so that the people in your life more and more come to think, you know what? God is different. What they have is different. And God is, means something to them and God is good to them. And Give thanks. Give thanks to God for his complete and perfect salvation, putting you in a position where you are in his welcome because the Father is gracious and because Jesus wants you there. Let me encourage you. Believe all that Jesus does for you. When you stand before the Father, you are not the worm you used to be. You are in Christ. So Christian, even post-gospel, right? Even post-moment of faith, Jesus continues to bless us. It's his work. It's his work, but we're still blessed. Having been justified by faith, we still get brought into the welcome, the hospitality, the generosity of the Father. And therefore, in Jesus' name, live and be thankful. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this word. We're thankful that positional truth is all over your word and that you constantly want us to know about it. Paul's letters, Peter's letters, the Psalms, what we have in you, how rich we are in you, not because of anything we did, but because of what your son does. Such thoughts are too wonderful for us. Help us to understand and to really appreciate this, the peace that we have with you the access we have into into this realm of grace, into this world of every spiritual blessing, to have have this reassuring hope that even in suffering, even in afflictions, we have strength, we exult, growing ever closer, growing ever deeper in our faith and our walk with you, knowing that you work all things together for good for us, for our good, and for your glory. Because that's what, that's what really matters. And we know Satan wants to, to, to lie to us, to trap us into thinking other things matter, that our salvation maybe isn't complete, or that, uh, that we don't have a reassuring hope, that, we don't, that our peace with you is somehow tenuous, precarious, is, is on a knife's edge, but our peace with you is sure our justifi- because of our justification. Thank you for these truths. Thank you for, again, repeatedly telling us in your word that the Holy Spirit has tell- told us in your word what we are to you through Christ. And Lord Jesus, we're so thankful for how you want us to be in the welcome of the Father. It's not ours to have. It's not ours to deserve. But you are a loving Savior. Thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen.